All right, gang, welcome to Riser's Treasure Hunting Emporium's Captain Kid series. In this series, we will travel back in time and explore the world of Captain William Kidd, try to separate fact from folklore, and even make an attempt to find a supposed buried treasure of kids located somewhere on the Delaware or New Jersey coastlines. So, armchair treasure hunters, sit back and enjoy our journey back to the late 1600s. Stay tuned. All right, gang, before we go digging up New Jersey and Delaware's combined 237 miles of coastline, we are going to try and narrow our search area. In order to do this, we are going to examine Kid himself and the history associated with him. We will come to know the man and the areas he frequented. Through the study of his personality and habitual traits, we will try to formulate and theorize kids' possible hiding places of his treasure. So first, here is some background information on Captain William Kidd. Captain Kidd was born January the 22nd, 1654 in Dundee, Scotland. Not much is known or can be documented about Kidd's early upbringing. After all, before he had a chance to write his autobiography, his body was swinging in a gibbet over the River Thames. However, we can pick up on Kidd's story in 1689 at age 35. He was a member of a French-English pirate crew that sailed in the Caribbean. Kidd and other members of the crew mutinied, ousted the captain of the ship, and sailed to the British colony of Nevis. There, they renamed the ship Blessed William. Kidd became captain. Now, this was either an election of the crew or by appointment by the governor of the island of Nevis. Captain Kidd and the crew of the Blessed William became part of a small fleet to defend Nevis from the French with whom the English were at war. By this time, Kidd had proven himself to be an experienced leader and sailor. This took cunning and intelligence. This also marks Kidd's departure from quote-unquote pirate to quote-unquote privateer. To simply define the difference between a pirate and a privateer, a pirate is a plunderer out for his and his own crew's gain with no regard from whom they steal from. However, a privateer is sanctioned by a governing body to plunder enemy ships and territories. Bottom line, one is legal and the other isn't. Both have the same career hazards, both employed the same type of men, both sailed ships in a predatory fashion, just one was sure to get you hung and the other hopefully not. So the British colony of Nevis needed a navy a navy that the colony could not afford to pay. So the governor of Nevis, Christopher Portington, authorized as a privateer, Kidd, to attack the French. And Kidd did so. Kidd and his crew attacked the French island of Marie Gallant, destroyed the only town, and plundered the area. Kidd and his men netted themselves around 2,000 pounds sterling. He was making a reputation for himself. During the War of the Grand Alliance, a war fought between the French and a European-wide coalition, Kidd was sanctioned by the provinces of New York and Massachusetts to capture an enemy privateer off of the New England coast. He did so, and again was building his reputation. By 1691, Kidd the privateer, with the foregoing reputation, was well familiar with the ports of the world, especially those of the 13 original colonies. Kidd was to become a New Yorker. Now, New York during Kidd's time, the population was only 5,000, and the skyline was very different than today. It consisted of two church steeples and a windmill. There was only a handful of paved or cobbled streets and a run-down city hall building. It was a thriving port, especially for pirates. Anyways, Kid the New Yorker set down some roots. He married a wealthy widow, and he owned several properties. 
such as 56 Wall Street, a mansion on Pearl Street, and 38 and a half acres that included a tanning mill. While in port, Kidd loaned his tackle to the First Trinity Church to assist in hoisting stone. Kidd was not only a captain of reputation, but also became a man of prominence. The church even granted him sale of pew number four at Trinity Church. Kidd, unfortunately, had a compulsion for greed. He could have very easily, with his then accumulated wealth, had retired and become a socialite. However, whether it was a scheme of his own or a plotted effort of his backers, Kidd was going back to sea. And not only was Kidd going back to sea, but he was going to sea with some very prominent and influential, and we will discuss later, dangerous backers. With Kidd's reputation and prominence, the scheme was easy to sell. He was to become a pirate hunter and privateer. He was going to sea to steal stolen goods and cargo from pirates and enemy ships. With this expedition, he needed front money, and he tapped the most wealthy and influential people of that time. So on to Kidd's backers. We have Robert Livingston, who at that time was the wealthiest man in the colonies, Charles Talbot, who was a wealthy politician, the Earl of Romney, who also was a wealthy politician, Lord John Summers, another wealthy politician, Admiral Edward Russell, high-ranking admiral in Her Majesty's Navy, Lord Bellamont, who was then governor of Massachusetts, not to mention the King of England, William III. After all, William III had to sign off on the proclamation granting Kidd permission to be a privateer. This grandiose scheme with wealthy politicians as backers we will soon see was the downfall of Kidd. Now, in a future episode, we are going to cover the plunder, and perhaps the blunder, of this voyage. So, in brief, Kidd overtook some ships, killed a member of his crew, and survived a mutiny. But, however, he lost his ship. Kidd was rumored to have turned pirate. That's right, a so-called pirate hunter turned pirate. Now, when the rumors reached England, those very influential and political backers needed to do that thing that politicians are so good at, backpedal and damage control. They ordered Kidd to be pursued and seized. After the mutiny, and with only 13 loyal crew remaining, Kidd sailed one of the prize ships to the Caribbean. There, Kidd learned that he was a wanted pirate. Kidd boarded the sloop Antonio and headed to New York with the supposed intentions of clearing himself. On the way to New York from the Caribbean, the sloop Antonio's boom iron broke, and they had to put in at Lewis, Delaware for repairs. Now, at this time, Delaware was still part of Penn's Pennsylvania. While in Lewis, several ex-pirates recognized Kidd. They informed Kidd that several of Kidd's mutineers had settled across the Delaware Bay in Cape May, New Jersey. Kidd became ever so cautious. With the mutineers back in the colonies, there was no telling what stories were told about him to save their own hides. He wanted to steer clear of them at all costs. Kidd resumed his journey, and instead of docking at New York, he landed at Gardner's Island, at the very tip of Long Island. There at Gardner's Island, Kidd buried some treasure, approximately 50 pounds of gold and 50 pounds of silver, in a cherry tree field. A stone marker still marks the spot. And in today's money, today's money, 50 pounds of gold and 50 pounds of silver, would be approximately $850,000. Kidd believed he could use that loot as an insurance policy if things went wrong. However, before he had a chance to bargain with it, it was confiscated. Lord Bellamont lured Kidd to Boston with promises of safety. However, and nonetheless, Kidd was arrested. After spending almost a year in solitary confinement, 
Kidd was extradited to London to be questioned by Parliament. He eventually stood trial before the High Court of Admiralty for the charges of piracy and murder. While Kidd was awaiting trial, he was held at Newgate Prison. There he wrote several letters to King William requesting clemency. However, that did not help. Kidd was found guilty of murder and five counts of piracy. He was hung at execution dock. During the execution, the hangman's rope broke and Kidd was successively hung on the second attempt. His body was gibbeted over the River Thames at Tilbury Point. It was a warning to would-be pirates. Anyways, oddly enough, some of Kidd's associates, who were also convicted, were pardoned just before hanging. Kidd's backers were embarrassed by his trial. Far from rewarding his loyalty by not naming names, they participated in his conviction by depriving him of money and information. It is my belief that Kidd's backers wanted Kidd silenced. All right, folks, that's it for the introduction. However, here are some things to ponder and will be discussed and explored in future episodes of this series. One, Kidd buried treasure on Gardner's Island. Did he also bury treasure while stopped at Lewis, Delaware? After all, he does make an account of others while incarcerated. Two, it has also been documented that Kidd's ex-mutineers were living in Cape May and in Town Bank, New Jersey, as well as Lewis, Delaware. Did they too bury treasure? Two of Kidd's crew members, Palmer and Bradenham, were granted pardons for testifying against Kidd. It has been documented that prior to their voyage to London, both pirates buried their personal loot before departing. Could any of Kidd's crew members who relocated to New Jersey or Delaware have buried their loot for safekeeping? 3. Can we in this modern day and age separate fact and fantasy and discover evidence of Kidd or Kidd's crew in either state? All right, folks, that is it for the introduction. Hey, we got some great stuff coming up. We have a visit to the Cape May County Historical Society. We have a visit to the Lewis, Delaware Historical Society. We got some treasure hunts scheduled, planned. Ah, oh, stuff you want to be a part of. All right, gang, that is it. Hey, stay tuned.